evening, everyone. Most of you will know quite a bit about Frank Chester. So I had to hunt a bit to find something that I thought you wouldn't know yet. <laughs> um, a friend of mine, Christine, when she first heard Frank speak, was in tears. Now, I don't think it's that unusual. Um, when Frank is talking about the heart, it can be very moving. But I saw something in Christine when she was in tears over, his, uh, over that talk. And it said to me, I think this is going back, way back. I think there are deep past connections here between Christian and Frank. And I think it goes back to Greece. Probably, I think she was probably in some kind of mystery school, mathematical mystery, some Pythagorean school in Greece. That's how deep it was. And so I would be at all surprised if Frank had been connected with the Pythagorean mathematical mystery schools in Greece. That seems to me very likely indeed. And I think the work he's going to do will spread and spread and spread. I think we're just seeing the beginnings of it. I think having found the geometry of the heart, this is just my personal intuitive sense, I think he will, the, the geometry of the other organs will be found. I think Frank has opened the gates to this, which will transform medicine and it'll go into agriculture, and it'll go into other fields. So it's quite a historic moment that we're able here to hear Frank Chester. Thank you for coming here. So I'm going to make some, in the, in the process, I'm going to make some pretty rash statements. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's going to like, what? But, you know, um, uh, here's what I think is best, is if you hold your questions to the end, because I like questions, but write them down or something, because if you don't ask questions, that means, uh, and, and you don't understand what I'm saying, or what I'm describing, or what I found, if you don't ask the questions, then you're going to have to go on faith that I am telling you the truth, or that this is real, or this is actually happening. And if you don't, if you go by faith, the only, that's the only one problem with that is that will lead to doubt. Or you will doubt what I am showing you. So it's very important to try to understand exactly what I'm trying to show you, so that doubt doesn't enter. We don't need doubt. We have enough of it already in ourselves. So I don't want my work to promote more. So um, that's what's good about questioning. Because everything that I will show you is lawful. There's no fantasy. There's no subjectivity. There's no sentimentality to any of this work. But this work is based on geometry. Okay, and geometry is very difficult. You can't cheat. <laughs> Two circles crossed like that. There's the point. I'm sorry. As many times as I wish I could have moved that point, um, I can't. But every single time I've gotten frustrated, something new comes that wouldn't have come if, if it had worked out in the first place. And also, I've been doing this for 12 years, and uh, what's so amazing about it is that there are things that I saw the first year I started, but only today I understood. It took me 11 years to understand something I saw 11 years ago. So if you're starting to do any kind of research or anything like that of your own, have patience. Because that, you never know how that's going to work out in the end. And you don't have to be sophisticated in what you start in your research at all, because I wasn't. Uh, and I had to develop all this on my own because there wasn't anybody to tell me what to do. And that's good. Don't expect somebody to tell you what to do. Okay, so one of the really neat things that I love, I want to tell you so much, <laughs> is that I just got back from Switzerland. And they invited me to the Grotiana, and uh, about three months ago. And I said, uh, well, why? And they said,
said, well, we're, uh, we're inviting uh, 12 artists and that uh, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of Rudolf Steiner's building impulse. So that includes this one building is kind of underground, means the first girthy on and the second girthy on. So, of course, what I thought of was that if I were invited to celebrate um, a, a, a cake, a hundred year celebration, it would seem to me that I should bring a cake. So I bought a building. And I worked on it for three months, although the, the work behind the building was, you know, from years of work. So I'm going to show you this building, uh, or how it was designed, in relationship to the Gertheon that's in Switzerland, that is definitely a mystery center. Okay? And we do not have a mystery center in America. Don't have one. So I'm hoping that if whatever, this will maybe encourage other people to design also buildings, okay, that are not only for our mystery center but even for the society. We, we, we need one. So, anyway, so I always kind of like to start out with something like this because this shows uh, something that what, what I do. So it's a blue ball with these kind of yellow. If I throw it up in the air, it becomes yellow. <laughs> now, you didn't see how that happened, okay? But I did. That's what I do. I look for what happened between the yellow and the blue. But you can't see. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's nothing there to be seen. So, um, <laughs> well, let's see. Now, the first thing that I should talk about is that this seven sided form is over here. Uh, and what's wonderful is that I took that to Switzerland. And it was put in a cube that was about eight feet by eight feet with that and nothing else but that. There wasn't anything on the walls, whatever. So uh, after two weeks, um, the Gertheon um, Archive Art Section purchased this for their permanent art collection. So now this is, this is, there's a shiny one just like this one that's now in the Gertianum that you can go see and when you go there in the library where all the archive or Lewis Steiner's work is. So um, the mathematics section has uh, completely accepted the surface are being equal, seven surfaces equal. They've accepted it and now they're behind it. So um, when I was there, I gave lectures to uh, two groups of scientists at the Wegman Clinic, the cancer research people I gave a lecture to, and the cardiologists I gave lectures to. And what's really great is the cardiologists, one of the things that I said that the heart does is that there is a vortex that doesn't go down to the apex of the heart. That's the very tip of the heart. And he said that's the reason why this fungus is starting to grow in people when they start to have congestive heart failure because the vortex is not getting down for me. So that made sense to him. So these kind of things, um, I mean, there's not a, a, another place I can think of that I would rather have somebody approve something is in that clinic. Mm -hmm. And then I also, uh, uh, I showed my work to the, the Oloid people, the Paul Schultz people, uh, and they want to work with it. So um, a lot of really good things came from it. So, um, what I want to do is to start talking a little bit about the Gertheanum. Um, and this is the drawing of the Gertheanum here. <coughs> you see that it's very seriously studied. Um, and um, I'm sure about it. I didn't have to do that, but anyway, these are the two cupolas that the Gertheanum has. Uh, and this is the study they go to to find out. So, I am going to show you um, how they did this. Um, before I do that, just to get the compass warmed up, I'm going to draw something that's, to me, it's just amazing. And that, yeah, everybody, okay, at some time has had this experience of doing this. And I, I just think, I never get over how unbelievable it is that I can take this I use the radius, the distance from the point to the periphery, and go around like this. 
I mean, this, this is so basic. It's divided the circle exactly into six. That's just amazing that that can happen. So that means that uh, if I draw a line around here, you get six sides. And also if I go from corner across, like this, I also get a six-pointed star. Everybody's seen that. But here's what's really amazing about it. Is if I, just tell me, what if anybody can spot this, what I'm going to draw, let me know. Now I'm going to start right here. And I'm going to do this freehand. Does anybody have any idea what I'm doing? Lotus? Lotus flower? What is it? Lotus flower? Yeah, what lotus flower? What, what, what is it? Twelve what? pointed? What's that? Twelve. Twelve? Twelve pointed. What, what, is, uh, what is this? What is that organ? What is that? What is that chakra? Heart. What, what chakra is it? Heart? Twelve pointed is the heart. It's the heart chakra. <laughs> it's the heart chakra. So it goes around like this. It has, you know, it has twelve of these little guys, which are kind of like leaves. So I work, work, you know, where do they get this from? This is the old yoga, you know, and it's the old India. What, what, you know, it's, what is this? Okay. So that just gets us warmed up into geometry. Um, so I drew this circle here because Rudolf Steiner's building is based on a pentagram which is a five-pointed star. So, um, I marked this out before you came, so I could do it easily. But geometry, to make five instead of six, is there is a procedure that you follow, and it becomes accurate. So in this process here, uh, there's a star, a pentagram. Nice, huh? That's really nice. All right. Rudolf Steiner took the pentagram, okay, and he made the building, the Grotiano, the first Grotiano, based on that. And look how simple he did this. He took the point of the top of the star, and he made a line that would circle the cross part of the pentagram. That's one cupola. The second cupola, he started down here, and he stretched it out here, and made the second cupola. That's the Gartheon. The chunk seems to be kind of uh, small. Uh, there it is. <laughs> So what he did, okay, was, what he did was he took uh, this line and this line and he crossed them here. And then he took this line and this line and now he has another pentagram. That is absolutely beautiful. That's the base of the Gertheon part of five. So that, that now becomes two circles. But you notice that there's a circle in the middle here with a little star, but you don't see that unless you turn it on its side. And that is the second circle, the third circle, which makes a third dimensional form. If that circle is not there, it's not three dimensional yet. So I'll show you how that works when you bring these two circles together like this. Where is that third circle? It's here. You see it inside? There it is. That's where the third circle comes from. So that means that this circle here has been twisted up. So now it's flat. But three dimensionally, okay, there are three circles. Okay, so that's what he did. He had these circles. <coughs> And I call it the little snowman. <laughs> yeah, and 
so what he did was he made these two circles here, and then he put a foundation on it. And there's your first good thing. Just a lot of you will recognize it. That's it. Now what's really interesting about this is that when he measured the distance across here to here, and from here to here, he got five here, and he got seven here. And five and seven is twelve. And so here it is. This is how it looks. The five and the seven. So, here it is. Sitting on this foundation. You see how this works. Do you see how that works? Look. See how that becomes three-dimensional? Five, seven. All the way around. But he only used half. I just used one half. All right, so there is the first Corinthian. The second one, he turned it inside out. He turned the building inside out. So all the outside surfaces now were on the inside. So on the inside, it was all curved. And when he turned it inside out, the outside became all concave. Convex concave. A reversal. That's taking something and reversing it. So, um, this is a reversal. Um, the, the one inside, okay, which is all points, becomes faces. This is called a dual. And this is a reversal. This is known in the element of air. And that's what he did. And that's important because I'm going to bring up something that shows that. And to make sure that that's accurate, you see, you have to make sure that the one inside has the same one as on the outside. So you can see that the cube now is half the size inside the one that was in here. Okay. So, here's this jump tree. This is what I did. I took, here, I'll, I'll make this better looking. This is, this is better looking, isn't it? Look. Just so happens to fit. <laughs> okay. So, when I studied the Gertianum, I, I thought that um, since my form was standing up, um, I knew that there were two circles also. And I wanted to find out if it was the same. So I'm going to show you, okay, that form, which I call the Chestahedron. Okay. I took what he did, the same thing that I did. This is two-dimensional, flat. And what I did is I took this, what he had here drawn, and I turned it in one time, and I enfolded it again, and now we have the chest of Adrian. Perfect. That's all that is. The building now is three-dimensional. It's based on a three-dimensional form. Now underneath it, okay, you have three points which makes a triangle. And if you see the side, there's a triangle there, one there, and one there. Alright, so when you open this up, when you open, when you when you, you call you close this up, I call it this is spiraling, this is a vortex. Okay, I found out that in the middle, there's a six. Just like I drew up here. There's equal distances from here to here to here to here to here. At a certain place, they're equal. So if it comes up too high, then this is too short. If it comes down too low, then this one's too long. And there has to be exactly some place where it's the the six is in the middle. And I did not know about that six, of course, until years. It seems so obvious. But... <laughs> so. so there's got to be another form here underneath. Okay, there's got to be a form under here. And there is. You can see that there's a triangle that's connected to this. Okay, so what is happening is that this is the form underneath. And underneath it is a tetrahedron that's opened up into six. So, if 
I open up a tetrahedron like this, yeah, I opened it up. I opened it up until it became six. That means from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, are all equal. And they are, look. And there is the six-pointed star at the bottom. It's also at the top. So here is the absolute amazing thing. This is mysterious, this is magic, but it's not irrational. It's rational and it's based on lawful movements. So if I take this one and I put it together in this one like this, They're exactly in the middle. They meet in the middle at six. Wow. Two forms come together and develop the six inside, completely independent of each other. And yet all the surface areas are equal. And this is exactly in the middle at six. But you notice that it's a little bit higher from here to here than it is at the bottom. And that bothered me big time because I wanted to know. <laughs> you know, can't cheat, right? If I move it up and down, then it's not going to be six anymore. So I lived with that for a couple weeks with depression. <laughs> so it happened, you know. So then I found out that if I put this into a sphere, it's exactly in the middle of the equator of a sphere. Exactly in the middle. So oh, I really. <laughs> okay, so here's the seven sided form. Flips right over. There it is. If I undo it a little bit, it turns into four. And if I flatten out completely, it's five. That's how it works. But you can see, okay, that this is not a bunch of fantasy. This is what's really happening. Now, I keep looking over here because I, I want to show you. Uh, first, I want to show you this. If you have a triangle, just like if you have two triangles, you can put a circle around it. You can put a block and put a circle around it. Should be pretty good. So that every triangle makes a circle. So what I tried to do is to find out exactly where the middle of the triangle was. That's easy. You just have to cross these corners. That's the middle. But this one here is a pain. <laughs> but it's you can find it, and I found it. It's there. So if I had a dot there, and a dot there, and a dot there, and I put holes through there, between my fingers there's a triangle. And there's also a triangle from here to here and here, inside. Does that make sense? Well, just in case it doesn't, I did it. I did the plastic. You can see where those two triangles are. They're in the middle of the quadrilaterals, okay, and they're in the middle of the triangles. But they're different sizes. If I make circles around those, okay, around those, um, that little piece of chocolate, there it is. I'm getting close, Daniel. Um, what I get are two circles, too. I get two circles, and they are uneven, because one of the triangles is bigger than the other. So I thought, ha-ha, I'm going to have these. So I said, okay, I'll put, uh, I'll put a, uh, a pentagram in. So I put a pentagram in one of the circles. Now, what I did was, I did it this way. I did the small one and the bigger one up here. Instead of putting the pentagram in the big one, I put it in the small one. And the reason I did that was because uh, I just <laughs> forgot which one to use. And of course, I... I knew there was a circle here too, okay, but it didn't make any sense because this was, oh, thanks a lot, Al, ah, you're so good. People got me some almonds. 
So I, I saw that I put a picture. See, what I want to do is relate this to the Grithiana. And so I put this, this star, okay, in here. And of course, uh, it doesn't do this. Because this is a different size than these two. This was, I'll show you how the difference, well, yeah, I'll show you. Here's the difference between the two. If I use the seven as the same size as the bigger one, the one at the top is bigger. See that? Uh, depression again. No. I want this thing to be the Garthiana, right? Standing up. It isn't. So, uh, this didn't work out. So, what I did is I said, well, when something doesn't work out, there must be something new coming. So, what I did was I extended this line up here to this circle. And this is a threshold, which we use in projected geometry. Once you get to a, a line, they go into the other side, so left becomes right, right becomes left. And so that's where a lot of people in the geometry are trying to use this to find out where the spiritual world is. They say this is the spirit, uh, and this is the earth, or the geo. Geography. Well, I was... This doesn't work for me. Projected geometry is fine, but it doesn't work for me. But it did in this case. Because when I brought this up here like this, this is the crossing point. This is the threshold between uh, suction and pressure. It's between the earth and the spiritual world. Okay, I found out that this distance here, if I took it all the way around, it divided this circle into seven. Now I had a 5 and I had a 7. And the reason that the distance was bigger on this one than on the Gertiana is because the 7 is divided at the periphery. And the 5 is divided in the periphery. And that's why they're different. But it's still 5 and 7. Now this is really great because 5 and 7, Durastani uses throughout the Gertiana big time. He uses them the columns. The columns, there are seven of them. And the columns are based on a pentagram. So they look like, like this one here. And this, this part of the, of the column, okay, I'm sorry, this is straight. And this part of the column, and this part of the column, are different woods. And the pentagram is in different wood than the ones on the outside. Now he has, uh, on the capital, and here's the capital, it looks like this and then the column, and then below is the seed part of the column. This is based on seven, from here to here. And this is based on five. So that means this is one and that's one. Again, he uses five to seven again. He also goes from the columns in the, in the Gertianum, there are seven of them, and they increase in size by one seven. So the column has five sides, and the the capital has seven. So five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven. So this was very exciting for me. So I will show you that, all drawn up uh, with geometry, based on how I did that. I started with a pentagram on the bottom, and I made the circle, and I extended across, and this is, this is the print of that, of that. There's your five. And if you extend this beyond this point, you project it down, and you run it up to the top circle, it divides this into seven. So now we have 5 and 7, which is 12. There are 12 stars, and these stars are created by the 7 and the 5. There are new stars never seen before, and it's running uh, across like this. It's going centric, peripheral, <coughs> centric. Well, these are all focused on the interior. These are all focused on the exterior. So I do have, I have the five and the seven, but they're different. So I also have them here. This is the five, 
And this is the seven. And I know the distance between here. Because I can measure it. So I found out that I need to put a circle here too. The third circle. And I did. Here's the third circle. It's right here. Mm -hmm. And the third circle, the word of that there is there. There it is here. Nope. You and I have to study it. No, it's right here. And what is amazing is that it's a six. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a five, a six, and a seven. No geometry in history has ever had those numbers in it. Now, how am I saying that that's a six? This is how I did it. This one. If I look here, this is five, this is seven, and the six is where the cupolas come together, right there, there's a circle right there that connects this, right here. This is where the sphere, okay, touches the center. Okay, so here's the seven-sided form. And can you see the triangles that have a circle around them? There's a triangle in there with a white circle. Can you see that? That's hard to see, but you can when, when I get through. And there's also another triangle here that is circled here. And I know the distance between those. So I was able to put the 5 and 7 together. There they are. There's the 5, and there's the 7 with the stars. So I found out that this is one cupola here. And if you take this cupola and continue it down, it touches the 6 perfectly. Which this shows. So there's your six. The cupola comes down to the six, and now the inside of that is six. The outside is seven here on the bigger circle, and on the little circle is five. And there is a star at the top of the cupola that goes down at an angle of 45 degrees and hits that star perfect. So this is part of the stage, okay? where uh, the performances, I designed this building for Eurythmy, for mystery plays, for musical concert, for lectures, for all the arts. It's basically geared to all the arts. So this particular, it shows here that through that five star, the new star is also the same ones. Okay, so that takes care of the cupola. Now, another thing about this form is, is that, uh, when you spin it, it turns into a bell. And that bell is what these bells are based on. Uh, and uh, what I'd use is I use this the Venus seal on this bell, and I use the Saturn seal on this bell. And I took these to the Gothianum and I rang them there. They're the first ever. This is the capital and seal combined. And this will be in the new building. This is an F sharp, apparently, some people tell me. And this is an E. Same metal, same size. Only difference is the shape. Okay. In this building, there will be a series of bells. Now, in the first note, the arm, there were columns, seven on this side and seven on this side. And, uh, and by the, uh, above each column, they had what they call an archiclide. And that was form that went from one capital to the other so that you could see how the transformation was taking place. And this one, what transformed between each one is sound, is tone. What's well, not something, it's tone, remember, is what brings form in, and so does color. Color and, and form is what brings form in. I'm sorry, color and tone. Okay. And these are all the seats. It's about 30 meters in diameter. These are all the seats. And sitting at an angle. Also, I have a stage on this side, on this side, as well as the main stage. The reason I do that is so that people that come in that are a smaller group, they don't have to have all these empty seats. They can use this side and this side. And the main stage. Okay, so 
It's coming close to I'm going to show you the building when it's all done. Um, I, I prepared you for this. Okay, I showed you how the cupolas come in and how they join together in the sticks. And when you look up into this building, there is a rim of light that goes all the way around unsupported. So there will be a bright light all the way around in a circle because the building is supported from the outside. Okay, so this is uh, Jim Heath has taken his photographs of my model. This is one of them. He has many of them. Uh, and, um, but I really like this one, so I had it blown up. <laughs> so this is the building. Okay, there's never been a building like this ever. <laughs> You can see why. <laughs> okay, so you have your two cupolas, which are now on top of each other, because they stand up now. The girl on them, okay, is laying down. These are standing up. We have one cupola on top of the other. Okay, so. The outside, okay, the cupolas are inside the seven-sided form. And the seven-sided form, which is the outside geometric design of the human heart, the way the archetype works, is on the outside. So the outside is supporting the inside. And these are here. And what they are is they're stained glass on the outside of the building, not on the inside. So the glass now is bringing color to the building, not bringing color to the inside of the building, but bringing color to the building itself. So you can see that as the sun goes across, the building is going to change colors. And this glass is based on tourmaline. And tourmaline is, a, is this colorful crystal that they found in a few places in the world, and they're starting to run out. But they're, they're based on this triangle, so that the, the color is not affixed to the building. The color is independent of the building. Completely independent because form comes from color. So as the sun goes across, these will change. Now I have this. These are copper, uh, a transparent type of copper. So these angles right here are the angles that the myofiber layers in the human heart are at 45 degrees when the heart is in its healthy condition. And that's what I've repeated here. Now, of course, this is round, which is this. That's the, that's the reason it's round, because this is what happens when the bell moves. Okay, it's got three cupolas. Now, one of the things that I found out was that when I went to the Grill Town the first time in, 19, in 2007, um, I showed my work there, and George Blocker, who was the head of the mathematical section at the time, said that if I could find the dual of the seven-sided form, if I could find the dual of this, that would be what goes around our heart when we leave our body at night and re reconstructs the, the human heart again for the next morning. So, of course, you know, that's going to motivate me. <laughs> Remember, this is the dual. Okay, so... In 2007, I discovered the duel. And what was amazing about it is that the, the mathematical section said it would be 14 sides. Of course, because this is seven, it has seven points. So when I started to do the traditional way that you take and transform a form into its duel, is you push points. Okay, you push points, push points, push points. That's what this is. If I push this point right here, it turns into a triangle. So if I push and push and push and push, it turns into the white one. If I push and push on the white one, it turns into the red one. Push, 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 push. So I started to do that with this time on this guy. And what happened was is that when I pushed certain points, I couldn't push them. I had to push a line in. This is the first time that platonic forms have ever been, or any forms, have just individualized push lines and points at the same time. And it's done logically. It's done, it's done by 
uh, a, a lawful process. So this is the first time that forms have ever been pushed and changed through transformation, metamorphosis, through lines and points. And what happened is I came up with a 13-sided form. First 13-sided form, okay, today's the 13th, this is perfect. <laughs> but I can show you the 13-sided form. I discovered in 2007 and did not work on it for five years. I still I have Matt helping me to, uh, to work on it. Uh, but what I found was that inside, here's, here it is. Here's the 13-sided form. And inside it is the 7. That's this one. And to prove that that is correct, okay, that means that, just like with this one, with these two, I should be able to put this, okay, inside a seven-sided form. I've got the seven-sided form around, i got the 13 around the seven, that means I should be able to put the seven around the 13, and it does. But now I have, okay, a lawful transformation of a form never seen before. This form has never been seen before, ever. And that's what's amazing, that the seven-sided form has never been here before. You know how many times people invent something and then the next week somebody else invented it? The fishing reel, it has all this way it organizes the string. One guy had that, invented it, and then within a week there was somebody else, that, uh, and another week the same, somebody else across the country developed the same thing at the same time. This is common, but no one in 12 years has ever come up with this form before. So you have to ask yourself, why? Why hasn't somebody else found this a week later? Or how about 12 years later? And the reason that it hasn't ever happened before, again, and how it hasn't happened in history before, and why it hasn't happened in the last 12 years, is because this is not an Earth-based form. This form was discovered. It wasn't invented. I didn't invent anything. It was discovered. Discovery is all different than somebody inventing something, and that's why it's not here. So, that's why this is so exciting that I can be able to work with this thing and find out that there is a 13-sided form that goes around the 7 and a 7 that goes around the 13. Because I incorporated that into, the, into this building. This building now has the 13 around it. And the reason it does is because it is protecting the building. Just like it helps to reconstruct okay, the heart uh, in the, in, in the uh, uh, nighttime when we, when we go into this, uh, we leave the body and go to spiritual world. So here it is. It's in edges, only lines only. And what's amazing is that it created a ring around here. And also, it got very, it's a different from here to here than it is from here to here. And why is that? Because I have now found, I made a new discovery within the last week, that I now know that form has thickness. This, these two spheres here are the same thickness. Just like a bottle or a glass, it's all the same. But I found out that forms like this aren't thin, like I've made it here. They have another form inside them. And what I found out was that form that's inside it is the thickness of the form. So the form is this thick here, and when it gets up there it's about this thick, when it gets up here it's about that thick. So that thickness is shown in this building. Now you can see that if you have a line here, like that, and then this is the other line, there is a thickness between here and here. And look at the thickness difference here. So this is the combination of the decatria with this thickness. And what happens is, why do I have all these lines here? Well, the reason is, is because that's the decatria in movement. But I've made these, I've designed them so they're nylon. So this building can be played. It can be the biggest musical instrument in the world. You can run a bow across it, you can pick it, it has all kinds of areas all the way around that have music. I mentioned this building is a fourth dimensional building. The Grote Honor is a third dimensional. Okay. So 
Uh, this particular ring is exactly at the equator of this sphere. I did not do that because the lawfulness of the form showed me where that was. These are the size of people here. There's more people men here. The stairs on both sides and so forth. So I'm going to show you a few things here um, that Jim did of this model. And uh, let's hope I can get this thing going without too much trouble. Uh, this, the first thing I wanted to come up here was, uh, was uh, here we go. Do you might have to tilt the lights down a little bit? Maybe? Okay, so here we go with this computer stuff. Okay. So here is the, the building that shows that it's five, six, and seven. The building is based on those geometries. And this is the building on the side. This cupola here is the gallery. But it can also be eliminated, and it could be just this form here, which is the bell. It's two stories. It's all dedicated to studios. Not only for music, but for pottery, Painting, all the arts. Um, another view of the whole thing. And then some, I think there's some close ups. Oh, there's another one. And Jim took these. I did this in three months. But I had all the year behind me to, to do this. And there's a tourmaline that shows that kind of paint and the gold and so forth that's shining on the building. And also, the ring that's at the top is also glass on the outside, and it's divided into 12, and it has the colors that were just kind indicated for the zodiac. Mm -hmm. There it shows you the tourmaline and its effect of the light on not only what's below it, which this is where all the seating is, it's a cone icon from the bell, and then all the way up to the top, where um, where the cupolas are. Now I had a, a pointer here, I don't see it, so I use this one. <coughs> this right here is an open gap, and in there light can stream through into six areas, which is because it's 12, or just because it's this drawing here, which is the chakra. Now here is also an opening. Here's the one I just described, it's based on six. This one, there is no, nothing obstructing that ring because the structure on the outside of the building is supporting these cupolas. So when you look up into this, okay, there's a ring of light. All right. <coughs> this is looking at the top on Mars. <laughs> Here's the ring. Few more pictures of it. Uh, uh, this is starting to show you the thickness from here to these strings right here. That's the thickness of this form. So we now have the possibility of finding out how thick a form is. It's not even all the way around. But these will all can be played. These will be music. This will be the music part that can be played. And what happens is that it develops its speed. So that it's accelerating in the front of the building, and it slows down on the back side because they get further apart. And also this one is also accelerating, but in the opposite direction. And of course, this is where it comes from. That's this one over here, like this one. And then uh, there's the stage with the bells. Um, they will be... Uh, placed in such a way that they'll be one-seventh bigger as they go across and in height. And of course, this is the bells that will be on them. There'll be seven of them like these, except they'll be all Rudolf Steiner's seals. And another picture of it. So you can see I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is going it all together. And I don't know if it's going to be the third jersey on them or if it's just going to stay in the living room. But that's okay. Well, that's it. Well, okay.
Okay, so anyway, uh, I'm going to go on into the other part of my lecture. Um, and before I do that, I don't know if any of you want to ask any questions or you want to wait, which is okay. It's either way. Let me get this on here. Now I've still got stuff up there. Ah, you see how organized I am. How do you get rid of that? You know how you turn that off? That's how I'm getting ready for the PowerPoint. Okay. I wanted to show you this too, just a minute. Uh, no, I, I, I'm going to show what Matt made this. Just uh, drift down the little gray. There you go. He's locked it up here on me, so there I got it. So Matt made this for me, and this is the Decatria with the, with the uh, Chester Hebron inside. Mm -hmm. So oh, isn't that nice, huh, that he made that? The only problem is, is that he won't give it to me. That was just a prototype. I wonder if it has something to do with the Mount Wood. Okay. <coughs> Frank, in terms, of the, in terms of the tourmaline uh, in that building, how do you get that so large, and, and or is it made out of pieces of tourmaline? Or? Um, the, remember that the tourmaline is the color design behind the glass, and the glass will be uh, uh, they're about this thick, pieces about like this that we'll put into a grid, and they'll be um, supported just like regular stained glass in the windows, except that uh, we don't need lead anymore because of the properties, but we need to have something that's flexible. So we we're going to a more polyurethane thing that way. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, if you stellate this and make this into a star, which I asked Matt to do, it looks like this. Geometry rocks. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you, let me show you why this is not a form from the Earth. I'll show you why. And the way I'll do that is I'll show you how Earth forms come in. The first form that comes into the world is a tetrahedron. It's known as fire. This is the first form. Nothing comes in three-dimensionally except this one. This is the first one. So, the next platonic form, okay, is known, this is, this is known as fire, the next one is known as air. So this is how they've done it in the past. They take the tetrahedron and they cut the corners off. That is an Archimedean form. This was discovered by Kepler, a lot of other people discovered this. Okay, that's a transitional form because we're trying to get to the, to air. We have fire. This is a transition between the two. So what we do is we take the tetrahedron and then we take bigger chunks off it. And now it's an octahedron. This is known as air. So in the past, what they did was they cut the corners off, or they pushed them. All right, so the next one is water. The next one is earth. The next one is sort of cosmos. All right, if I take these and I cut these corners off, it looks like that. That's a transitional form. If I continue to take the corners off, it turns into a cube. Now you see why these forms and where they came from. If I take this guy right here, and I push edges only, it turns into a dodecahedron. Now people know where the dodecahedron is. I haven't found anybody that's been able to tell me where this comes from. It comes from a cube. And how I found that out is because I studied pyrite. This is the pyrite dodecahedron. And this is the pyrite cube. And I studied these two and found out how to do it. If I push the corners on this one, or cut the corners off, it turns into an icosahedron. And there are your five platonic forms. One, two, three, four, five. That's where they come from. But where is this one? 
<laughs> That's got to be somewhere. I mean, this is it, this has to be somewhere because it has too many characteristics that are unbelievable. It has equal. See, these have equal surfaces. This one does too. These are equal surface areas, but they're different. This is a triangle and a quadrilateral. These all have the same polygon. They're all squares or they're all triangles. But this is the combination of triangles and squares. All right, so what's the deal here? Here is a, this is a fluoride, a fluoride crystal. This is a, a, a octahedron. These are found in nature. And the cube, of course, and the octahedron. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come around here and I'm going to set this down here because I want to put them on Earth. these are earth-based forms. So something is different about this. Okay. This is the threshold. This is. And this is the threshold between the physical and the spiritual. It's also the difference between pressure and suction. It's also the difference between contraction and expansion. This is an expansive form. This is based on suction. So how did this come about? It came about the same way that these came about. It started out as a tetrahedron. Now, Rothschild said that the tetrahedron was exactly the same form used for fire or warmth. So this is the etheric, according to him, and this is the part that sits to suction, less than nothing. This is more than more. <laughs> so what I found out, how this happened, was that this is, what's happening is that this, <clears throat> So now you'll see where this came from, and why there's nothing else been done like this before. No one's ever done this. We've been studying these things for uh, at least recorded uh, 3,500 years. So what happened is that what I did is I took the tetrahedron and I opened it up. That's what I did. I opened up the tetrahedron like this. And when I did that, I got my first form. Right here. That worked. See how the blue, huh, is the part that's a uh, surface. The surface makes the blue. So you know exactly how high it is. And this is at right angles. This is 90 degrees. But the problem is it's not this one. This one, what had to happen is that this had to open up more. And what it did is it opened up enough to make the seven sided cone. Now we have this form. This form is coming from expansion. Now, if, if I continue to do this, if I continue to do this, this is what's amazing, if I continue to do this, so I have the seven now, equal surface areas. And thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Ron Monroe, Moreau, he did all the mathematics for me on this. And this is all his mathematics that he did um, by hand to, to prove that the form was perfect, that the surface areas were exactly the same, and the transitions were correct. And then, Dr. Carl Merritt did the same thing on his computer and came up with the same figures at 94.8. So now I have the confirmation that this is an equal surface area form. If I continue to open this up, it looks like this. I notice what's happening here is that many, and what's really, really, really interesting about this whole thing is that this is nothing but an octahedron. With a tetrahedron on top. 
That's what this is. So when it comes to air, now that's the earth part is air. The earth part, okay, the, the etheric part, okay, um, let's see, I'm talking so much. Okay, it's fire and warmth. This is air and light. This is the form of light. So light is nothing that is air warmed up by a tetrahedron. This is the form that's exactly the opposite, okay, of what is on the earth. Here's the one on the earth, and the other one is expanded with a tetrahedron on side. The same size tetrahedron we started with, and this one is exactly half the size. This is expanded to black to be twice. Now if I continue to go on with this, it turns into this. <laughs> There it is. Now what's amazing about that one is that it's an icosahedron. It fits inside an icosahedron. That's this one. <laughs> so in the in the in above the threshold. Okay, Rudensteiner says that we become perfect geometrists when we cross the threshold. Nice. When we come back, we forget. If that's so, that means that the Platonic forms are also in the spiritual world, but they're they're transformed. Now, if I continue to go on with this, okay, and I flatten it out, it becomes a prism. So this point, this point, this point go into infinity all the way to another one, wherever that is. And if you continue to open this up and reverse it, which is like this one, and now you're reversing it, and it's coming around again now, okay, it's now going below us, not above us anymore, it's going below us, and it's turning right back up again into a Saturn form of warmth, which is the tetrahedron upside down. Now you have an understanding that you've never had before, no one else has had before, of form. There is a form, there are logical, lawful forms and then all across the threshold. Now, so this is probably the most amazing thing that I can show you tonight. As I put this tetrahedron in a cube, and it fit. A tetrahedron goes right in there, no problem at all. It goes in, and all of these are root two. This is one, this is root two. It touches all the way around. It touches the points, it touches the edges. Okay, so what I did is I took this guy here, which is the same, and for fire as warmth, so this is fire, this is warmth, <coughs> this is taking warmth or fire and putting it into a cube. And what I did is I twisted it. I put it into a vortex. And what happened was, is that I vortexed it in the cube, starting with a tetrahedron, and I moved it lawfully to the middle of the first square, there were 16 squares. I moved it to the middle, okay, of the very edge of the first square, to a, in the middle of the second square, right to the middle. So this is the way that the heart sits in our body. It sits at 36 degrees. And this is what it's doing, is it's spinning like this. Now, I'll show you that's just so amazing, this, you'll see this, that it gets to the point here where it can't go any further. And when it turns again, it expands, it gets bigger again. This is the missing link of Girthian science. Girthian science always has the plant and the seed it gets bigger and expands up until it reaches maturity, and then it goes through a death cycle and dies and it goes small. This is just the opposite. This starts, it starts expanded, contracts, and expands. This is the missing link. Now, if I take the last one off here, the last one, and I take it out of here, 
It's the same as this one. They're exactly the same, except they're half the size. This is the inside of the heart. This is the outside. This goes inside. So, we now have a transformation, okay, that's going on in a cube that is showing me something that I need to show to you and I have no idea what you're going to think of this. I don't even know what I think of it. Alright. The human heart is the balance between the physical and the spiritual. It's a grounding and expanding at the same time. It's centric and peripheral. It's suction and pressure. This form right here is expanding. Okay, it's expanding as big as it can. And as it goes through here into this process, okay, until it hits the midsection, which is the heart. This is a form that is expanding in the spiritual world in a cube that's contracting. So the heart, okay, when it goes into congestive heart failure, it's expanding too big and it gets kind of round. That expanding heart is contracting. And so that medicine or, or, or uh, um, uh, herbs or um, uh, Doctors or therapists or psychologists can look at an expansive form as a representation of something that's contracting. And something that's contracting is a symptom of expansion. So what do you do? If something is expanding too much, okay, what do you do? You try to you try to make it less. You try to make it reduce it to contract it. But the what what, the, what this is showing is, is that the expanded form is it is contracting. That means you need to expand it more. A contracting form, okay, is expanding. So if you want to work with somebody who's contracted, okay, you work on the contraction. You don't work on the expansion. You work on the contraction and you make the contraction worse. That allows it to expand. That's what this is telling you. That's what this is saying. It's not coming out of me. It's not my idea. It's coming out of the form. The geometric form is talking to me. This whole thing, this whole thing you've seen here, is the communication that I have with this form. And that's so unbelievable that an expanding form is expand, it is contracting. It's a contracted form. That means that a contracted form is expanding. And that way, to keep the expanding down, you contract it more. Think of that. Think of it. I mean, does that make any sense to you guys? I mean, that is, is that wild or what? So that's what I found. The geometry is teaching. Um, and uh, I, 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 I guess I can ask you, you can ask me questions. So yeah, see, so from what you just said, it's almost like you're saying likes cure like. I'm saying what? Like the likes cure like. Like. Like you me off you. Like. You're, you're like. not saying I'm going to try the opposite to try contraction. it. I'm, I'm Cures not, contraction. Yes. Yes. That's the that's principle behind homeopathy. That's the principle behind what? A homeopathy. Well, I'm not sure that. <laughs> <laughs> they just take more physical substance away so the spirit is more present. But they're giving well, that's you, good. They're giving I, yeah. you the, the, you know, the, your poison even more, in a sense. It's just yeah, spiritual. If that is true, at least now we have geometry that shows that it's true. <laughs> we have a lawfulness here that's not based on, or we have a hunch, or we believe this, or no, I doubt that. No, I doubt that. No. This is showing you that this is the way it is working. Oh, any questions? Any more questions? Oh, I have one in the back here. Yeah. Oh, me. Um, <laughs> no, I kind of have an observation maybe. You can do with it as you want. But 
when you opened up that tetrahedron, it creates the spaces in between the three equilateral triangles. You take your star and you impose that down into it and fit it in it. You take your star and fold it over and fit it down into fill those spaces, as you did in the very beginning. It's kind of like a metaphor for the earthbound opening up and bringing in the cosmic. Yes. See, what you just said is exactly what's happening here in the human heart. This is what's happening. The human heart, according to Rudolf Steiner, says that there is a form that's contracting, coming down and spinning, and this one is spinning in an opposite direction, and they intermingle, okay, and they intermingle like this, so this one is going this way, and this one is going this way. That's exactly the movement of the heart. Inside the heart, that's what's going on. And when they come in together, okay, they meet. Well, I didn't do it right. <laughs> just that alone, what you've just seen is the biggest mystery I think I've ever seen, that I've come up with. That you can bring two forms together, both have six, and there are different configurations and they meet perfect. And that's what they say, this is what Rudolf Steiner says, happens in the human heart. He says, what comes from, the, from above is the ego, and what comes from below is the astral. And those two mingle together, and they're in opposite directions, and they're vortexes. And this is nothing but a vortex. This is the <coughs> geometry of the vortex. Yeah, Dean? So you're saying that when those two uh, spirals are, are meeting each other, they're creating those vortexes, and when they reach a still point, yes. that form is made. That's right. And there's still point. Yes. The heart comes to us when we stand still. I think it's one seventh of a second. Mm -hmm. Another seventh. <laughs> That's because it reverses. And the inside is reverses like this. And I found out that this is the way the inside works. The inside here, okay, this is this part of the, of the form. This one. Of course, it's huge. But it's the one that's in here at the bottom. It's that one. What happens is that they say that the heart at the top, which is called a base, that this particular shape of, of the inside of the heart, which they call um, the interior um, architecture, that this part here spins in the opposite direction of this one. When, um, they, they spin in the same direction like this. They spin like this. But what happens is that this one, all of a sudden, will reverse. And look, there's how it reverses. And then what happens is the apex fills and spins. The geometry now is showing how that works in our heart. This is known as rapid filling. Because what happens is as this turns in the opposite direction, one goes clockwise, the other goes anti-clockwise, that right there, no blood enters when that happens. It's called a disassociation in time. And what happens is the valve, both valves are closed when this happens. So this is building up a suctional part in our heart that once the valve opens, the apex moves down, they say. The geometry is showing that, that that is correct, what they found. The things that they find with these magnetic images that they find is correct, based on the lawfulness of the geometry. This is a constricted heart, okay, this is completely expanded, and this is the normal one. This is the interior uh, chamber architecture. And of course they all move. But some hardly move at all. It's very hard to move them. That's why they call it a giraffe heart. They call this a giraffe heart because the giraffe has to suck the blood all the way up to his head. So it has this type of more form. But this is, this is not good for us. Okay? And neither is this one. So the idea is, and in our human heart, is that what we're striving for is that this one and this one happen. And what happens in the middle, which is the normal one, okay? that we don't get stuck with the, even the normal one. We want to be able to expand and contract. This happens to be the, the, middle, the middle realm. And the middle realm is fine, but if we get stuck over here, or stuck over here, we have congestive heart failure. It's very flexible in our thinking. We have to make sure that we don't get stuck in one or the other. We don't become a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> It's just unbelievable how these polarities go on because they're very, very harmful for our human heart. They're against the movement. <laughs> oh, I have a 
Oh, here's another good question. Would you see in the future any stand up and speak? Yeah, I have to. Would you see in, in the future any implications for actually healing a heart that has uh, areas that are hardened or stenosis, or yes. using magnets or using some sort of structure, some sort of structure in the real heart? Well, you mean. You mean by using geometry, or mean yeah. by uh, yeah. I mean yeah. using it in the real field, in yes. the medical field? Correct. Well, what they do in the medical field is just expand it too too much. They put a net around it, squeeze it. If it's contracted too much, they put a net on the inside and move it up. So uh, there's all kinds of techniques that are being used to try to get the heart more healthy. But even if they do that, it's still not going to be able to contract and expand like a healthy heart. Okay, and that's our that's. We can go in and have this done to our heart, okay? And then we can save our life or whatever. But we need to do this before this happens. We need to change our behavior now, not in wait until we're in trouble. And the way we do that is to keep an open mind and try different things. Go home a different way sometimes. I mean, it's just very simple things. Yes? So the heart is too big when the apex is too high up. It's expanded. Yes. So there's this, it struck me, there's this paraphrase by Khalil Gibran that says, let sorrow dig itself so deep in your heart that you may be filled with that much more joy. And that's just a paraphrase. That's not exactly a quote. But it's almost like the like attracts like is the embracing of sadness, the embracing of, of the things that we dislike in the world. And that's actually what what drops the apex down and creates the expansion, creates the joy that we experience out of life, and almost re restructures the heart as you show it. Well, you know, um, this is all based on an artistic di uh, uh, discovery. This wasn't a scientific discovery, this was an artistic discovery that went into geometry to became a model. So artists, okay, a lot of time will find ways to express things that's actually happening in the heart. And so, did you say Gibran? Yeah. That guy's well, great, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the reason it's, it's so remarkable is because our culture is one that is afraid of itself. It's afraid of its own fear. And it's completely running away from that. So it's, it's kind of an antidote right there. It's like embrace the fear, you know? Yeah, I think Khalil Gibran said, don't get stuck in the middle. Your deepest sorrows become your greatest joys. If you can't experience pain, you will never experience joy. No profit. <laughs> on, your, on your structure here, uh, first of all, I think you're uh, Bucking forward to the nth degree here, almost. <laughs> uh, and I mean that as a as a great the geodesic dome inventor. You know, uh, I think you've gone beyond him. Um, and I don't want you to get a big head on that one, but on, the, on, on this on your on your structure here, do you foresee other than uh, is somebody standing inside the structure, other than somebody perhaps imagining that they are feeling energized or or whatever, do you see any? Focusing and bringing in of energies that you know, I mean, quantifiably ch shifts in energy that that somebody standing standing inside a structure would experience. I mean, it's it's all this exotic or eccentric geometry that you brought together in this thing. Do you see any kind of a bringing in and focusing of energies? On it? Yeah, of course I feel that, and um, this is based on the human heart and. The, the few people that have commented on this that I know that have an interest in this kind of thing is they say that this is where the grail study should be taking place. This is where grail studies would be done. And so, um, and there are groups that do this. Form affects us. Okay? We are form. Form has a function and function has a form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That form, okay, his function is balance. That's his whole function. That's what the geometry is. It's like I bring those two together and they're both sixes. 
That's an absolute balance. So that building is balanced. That building is not. Uh, that building would encourage an imbalance to be cured. And you know, I mean, what does real center do? Okay. If you look at all the buildings that have been done after the of the Amazon, everybody does the same thing. They make sad windows and sad doors, <laughs> and they cut the corners off, okay? and they make everything cut at angles and whatever. And the thing is, is the spiritual world also has angles. And um, it also has, it has the convex and the concave, which just has both. That's why it's a balance between straights, curves, Rounds, uh, concave and convex. That's part of the balancing that goes on in here that will go on in us. Now, if I was able to build that, okay, in such a way that I could put it in a prison, and I put certain prisons, prisoners into that building, and then I put the rest of them in what they live in, you know uh, there's going to be a change. Absolutely. Because these buildings affect us. Just as water is affected by prayer. And especially this guy, this Japanese guy, Odo, I think his name is. He, he's, he's, uh, he's showing you that water is affected. We're in 80% of water. Form affects us. And so I think that what we should, what we got to do is we've got to start new. Now this, I'm hoping that this will encourage other architects to get going. Okay? And, and, and use what Rudolf Steiner did. And develop it further, go a little further than he did. That's what he wanted. Now the story is walking along and he starts limping. Right? And the guy says, That's why why are you limping like that? It's just because I want to see how long it takes the people behind me to limp. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you see, um, we have to stop copying. And the copying is over. We really do. We have to stop copying. We learn by copying. There's nothing wrong with learning about it. Because I learned a whole bunch of stuff about the Grotheana that related to what I found. Okay, I had to learn about it, but I didn't copy it. But I learned about it. And that's what we all have to do, is learn from it, not copy it. So, the painting these fruits and uh, apples and oranges on the, foot, on the, you know, on the table, or the tablecloth, um, that's fine to learn how to paint, but gee, you've got to stop doing that. <laughs> God, something has to be changed so that we understand that what we're looking for is what is not seen. Because what's not seen, okay, is life. And that life, if we can discover it, then it makes our, our life more life. I am Daniel. <laughs> Teachers know that when they do form drawing with the students, it's energizing for them, and the next day they will be more healthy and energized through working with form. So I wonder whether everybody here tonight, having had this incredible introduction to form, be interesting to see how you feel tomorrow. I'd be very interested to see how energized people feel tomorrow after having experienced this tonight. And some of you will be coming back to do work. Um, with Frank tomorrow. We'll, we'll be coming back to the um, workshop tomorrow morning, 9.30 to 12.30. If you haven't yet signed in for that, sign in before you go. And I also, um, I asked Dr. Marek to say, say something. You know, <coughs> one, of the, one of the miracles is that Frank has done a lot of this work out of his living room. And so now there is an institute being formed to try and create a real lab space for him. And Frank, do you want to say a word about that? I mean, sorry, Carl. <laughs> All my work has come out of the living room. <laughs> it's oh, a fabulous living room. <laughs> but, um, Frank has outgrown his living room and has so many more ideas and so many important discoveries yet to make that we, uh, a group of uh, doctors, psychologists, teachers, a uh, very small focus group, decided that we needed to form 
uh, an organization, not really an institution, that would allow Frank to receive the support uh, for bringing this into the larger community, into the nation, and, and really into the world. And so after having brought this impulse to the Gurdjianum uh, in December, it's really a very wonderful time of birthing now. And so we ask to have you know about it. It's called the Seven Circle Foundation because it's based on, on seven circles that really interact. And we are all in a discovery process with that, how that will ultimately manifest. And we're looking for support, both spiritual uh, interest, uh, both uh, financial support, if you have access to that or can put us in touch with people who can do that as well as a willingness to learn so that we can collectively become the seven-fold organization uh, to externalize this wonderful seven-sided form which is teaching us. And it's really called the Chestahedron, uh, not because of Frank being called Chester with this name of this incarnation, but because in our chest we have this form sitting as the cube in the heart in which this form is actually forming the left ventricle of the heart. And so that's what Frank discovered and uh, doctors absolutely need to know that because we're coming into a time of energetic medicine, that's the field I'm, I'm in here in Santa Cruz, but this energetic medicine is really the medicine of renewal. And as I think one person said, um, the illnesses that we have nowadays from too much information literally on the planet is a lack of coherence and the heart brings that coherence, that balance, that uh, understanding again. So um, just as when there is too much uh, physical imbalance, uh, for example, the heart gets a congestive heart failure, and becomes more spherical, expands too much, it contracts often in the spiritual. And so homeopathic, as somebody mentioned, is to give something that would normally, when you give it to a healthy person, expand their heart, it would be used homeopathically to help bring the heart back into balance. So that's really what, what this new medicine is about. And it's starting to really come into the mainstream. But I think Frank's work as a geometrician as an artist, as an inventor or discoverer really, a pathfinder, that work really needs support in the world. And uh, we're very, very lucky that here in the Bay Area, this all happened in this living room in the Presidio in San Francisco. And Frank really is being tethered by all these forms that he has to lug around. We ultimately need a place for collaboration. So that's what we want to create together. And anything you want to do, whether you want to sign up on a list or stay in touch, or go to his website and put some feedback in frankchester.com. All of that will be helpful, and Seven Circle Trust will also be creating a website now. So we'll invite you to be co-conspirators, co-discoverers, and co-players in this wonderful initiative.